Good afternoon, you wee bastards, and welcome to the highly anticipated video on adding modern high battle rating tanks into War Thunder. This is a project I've been alluding to and hyping up for weeks, months even, ever since the series on suggestions and corrections for top tier tanks and gameplay, which I finished off yesterday. If you didn't know, that whole series was leading into the potential addition of MBTs like the Leopard 2A5, M1A2 Abrams, T90M, following the 10.0s that we have already. Or should I say 10.3s? So in yesterday's video, for anybody who hasn't seen it, we did a refresher of the entire series, describing the way some current 10.0 tanks could move up to 10.3 and setting the stage for this video. So if you have not seen that video, pause this one, go watch that, there will be an annotation on screen, link in the description. This video is going to build heavily off of the tech trees that were established in that video, filling battle ratings up to 10.3. Consider this video part two and that video part one, so you know, don't watch part two before part one, am I right? What I aim to do with this video is suggest a potential tech tree which includes tanks that will build on our current in-game tech trees all the way down as far as I believe War Thunder can and should go. We're going to talk about figures such as armor effectiveness, shell penetration, speed and mobility, and a whole bunch of other factors that will go into balancing these tanks in the way I have proposed. Actually, that is exactly what this video is, a proposition. So with that in mind please make sure you watch through before arguing certain points because the whole video is relevant to every point i'm going to make throughout it every battle rating is completed so at least wait to the end of a battle rating section before arguing what should move where we'll touch very briefly on the history of each vehicle but i'm going to primarily keep away from its successes or failures in real world use i'm focusing on the way these vehicles will function within the confines of war thunder as the game is currently built so systems like thermal optics and ballistic computers and technology technologies like the hunter killer system on the M1A2 Abrams will not be touched on, as those kinds of things aren't modelled in game currently. Keep in mind that all this is subject to my own personal opinions on what I believe will be balanced, so feel free to disagree if you feel differently about how these trees should be structured and what vehicles should line up against each other. Now as I said yesterday, none of this relates to any sort of leaked data from Gaijin. This video is completely made up of suggestions that come from my mind alone, but I believe that this is the best and most balanced way these tanks could be implemented based on the data I have collected, so if they are implemented in this way in future, calling it here. I'm sure I'm going to get comments like, Gaiju needs to fix the game instead of adding new shinies. Yes, maybe they do. This video isn't supposed to say that adding these vehicles is what should be done right now, but more to say, if these vehicles are added, then this is the way in which they should be to keep things fun, balanced and interesting. And we know that Gaijin does plan to add more modern vehicles with the introduction of the Challenger 2 coming this patch. I have done a lot of research on these machines to build up these tech trees. And <laughs> I mean a lot. That's the main reason this video has taken so long to finally get out. This is certainly the most research I've ever done for a video. But for anyone who wants to argue slash correct the values I'm going to put forth, please do provide any sources so that I can check them out compare them and if i do say anything wrong in this video i apologize and i will pin a comment correcting it i'm almost completely sure that all of the values i'm going off to balance these vehicles are the most reliable estimates out there though using the best information i've been able to find in the weeks and even months i spent researching for this video shout out to scavenger for being an absolutely tremendous help in collecting all of this data by the way what we're going to do is go by battle rating rather than by nation detailing all of the tanks that will fill that battle rating for each nation and why they've been put there, discuss what shells they'll use, and talk about what the game might look like for them. This is working off of the game's current BRs, adjusted after the last video, so the IPM1, Leopard 2A4B, Challenger 2, T80BV, and Type 90 are the highest battle rating vehicles currently, all sitting at BR 10.3. We're also once again ignoring the recent ballistics update that changed APFSDS shell penetrations, and assuming that all shells are performing accurately for the sake of keeping things as simple to understand as possible. Please note that I am only covering the main battle tank additions here, so no missile SPAA, no IFVs, and we're also not talking about mechanics that could be implemented such as tank lights, historically accurate optics or thermal sights, or any kind of things like that. That's a topic for a whole nother video, but we're going to ignore that sort of thing for this video. Right, well, I think we've outlined the project well enough. I hope you lads enjoy this video. I spent a ton of time working on it for you guys, and it would really mean a lot to me if you'd leave a like if you do enjoy it, and share it around as much as possible with friends or on social media. Anyway, lads, it is time to get started.
We're starting right where we last left off, at battle rating 10.3. Once again, this is where the IPM1, Challenger 2, BTEC Leopard 2A4, T80BV and Type 90 sit currently. Only one new addition here, the Soviet T72B, Mod 1985. This is an upgrade to the T72A scene in game, featuring new onboard computer systems and such, but most importantly, new armour and firepower. The armour of the T72B is actually superior to that of the T80B currently seen in game, although not by much, and it uses the same 2A46M 125mm smoothbore gun, an auto-loading mechanism, as its predecessor, the T72A. The armour protection of the T72B is slightly above that of the T80B in its kinetic effectiveness, while being noticeably superior in chemical protection on the turret, and most importantly, it does not have nearly so big of a driver port weak spot. Something that is also worth noting is that the T72's auto-loader puts both the projectile and explosive charge lying horizontally in the autoloader, unlike the autoloaders of the T64 and T80 series, which put the explosive standing upright. This basically halves the height of the autoloader, thus making the tank significantly less likely to be ammo racked through the ammunition carousel. Like the T80BV at the same battle rating, this tank fits Contact 1 explosive reactive armour. Remember that the T80B at 10.0 doesn't use ERA anymore, as I said in yesterday's video. Given a superior chemical protection of the T72B's armour itself, plus the addition of ERA, no grime based ATGM currently seen in game would be able to penetrate it frontally. The tank has a lower power to weight ratio than the T80B, but slightly higher than the T72A, and although 4 tons heavier, it should retain at least the same speed if not better, roughly 60 kph. My suggestion for shell options would be the 3BM29 APFSDS shell stock with 520mm flat penetration, and 3BM32 Vant as the modification, with 560mm effective penetration. The tank would also fire the standard Soviet heat FS and HE frag rounds found on the T80B currently in game, as well as the 9M112 Cobra ATGM with a very nice penetration of 650mm. This is exactly the armament I suggested for the T80BV at 10.3 last video, which makes sense as this tank has slightly superior armour but much worse speed. This is where things start to get really fun, battle rating 10.7. Here we start seeing some of the big dogs, and we're entering this new tier with the American legend, the M1A1 Abrams. Now, I'm sure all of you know what this tank is, but to sum it up, it's an IPM1 with the M256 120mm smoothbore gun. This gun is derived from the Rheinmetall L44. Guys, they are not the same gun. The M256 is substantially modified to the point where you could not fit an L44 into the Abrams or the M256 into the Leopard 2. So, the M1 Abrams was originally designed with the 105mm M6. 68A1 rifled gun in mind, the 120mm was to reduce ammunition storage capacity so much that the US Army did not want to use it originally. However, it was decided to go ahead and produce the early model Abrams with the 105mm gun and upgun it with the M256 at a later date. The later model M1A1 would be fitted with the 120mm gun as standard, and obviously this became not only the favoured option, but one of the signature characteristics of the modern American main battle tank. The M1A1 Abrams is, in all regards but the gun, identical to the IP M1, with the same armour, same power pack, etc. This variant of the Abrams does not have any depleted uranium armour, that would come later on the M1A1 HA for heavy armour, and yes, we'll get to that later. So we're looking at roughly 440mm KE effectiveness on the turret, 350mm on the hull, and roughly 1100mm chemical effectiveness on the turret, with around 650mm on the hull. People have pointed out that the M1A1 would get heavier and therefore be slower than the in-game M1 and IPM1, and that this would be a good balancing factor for it, however this really isn't the case. The weight difference between the IPM1 and M1A1 is so negligible that it will make no noticeable difference in acceleration, maneuverability, or top speed on and off road. Maybe 2 kph top speed, that's about it. The balancing factor will no doubt be the reload time. One of the main factors making the current in-game Abrams model so good is their 5 second ace reload, while its main contemporary, the Leopard 2, has a 6 second ace reload which the M1A1 is likely to match. The armor-piercing shells fired by the M1A1 are depleted uranium monoblock longrod APFSDS shells and will consist of stock the M829 shell with 470mm flat penetration and 225mm pen at 60 degrees, and as the upgrade module, the very well-known M829A1 silver bullet used extensively in the Gulf Wars with a hair over 560mm flat penetration and 330mm at 60 degrees. This is slightly higher 
firepower than the German DM-33, but keep in mind that it could not penetrate the turret jigs of the SeaTech Leopard 2A4 from any more than a couple hundred meters away at most. The Leopard 2A4, however, will have an easy time penetrating the M1A1's turret jigs from any range. Another factor worth noting is that with these other tanks at this tier having superior penetration, but the M1A1 not having superior armor, it's probable that at close ranges, everything at this tier will be able to penetrate the full length of the Abrams turret, punching through the ammunition blowout panels and causing a cook-off to kill the tank, as if the blowout wasn't even there. This takes away that legendary Abrams survivability, and so with superior penetration yet inferior armor and frontal survivability, I feel like the M1A1 will be nicely balanced at 10.7, especially given what else is to come. For Germany, 10.7 will see the Leopard 2A4 with the C technology armor of the late 1980s. What this is is a new, more effective composite armor array for the existing Leopard 2A4 tank, which was developed in 1987 and adopted in 1988. As such, the dimensions, onboard systems, mobility, all these factors remain the same. The visual model would be near identical, very easy for Gadget to have modeled. All that would change in the model is the armor's effectiveness. The SeaTac armor brings the Leopard 2A4's turret shakes up to 550mm effective against kinetic energy munitions, that's superior to the Challenger 2, while giving it an effectiveness against chemical warheads of over 900mm. The hull's protection was raised to 425mm kinetic and 750mm chemical protection. This armor would be seriously effective at this tier, with the turret shakes being impenetrable by most of the tanks at the same BR at anything further than point blank range, and the hull being seriously effective in a down tier. Of course, the gun manlet is still a significant weak spot, but it would be raised in effectiveness over the current Leopard 2A4s, which, remember, is still underperforming. This tank, given the lack of ammunition storage in the right side of the turret, may honestly get greater survivability than the Abrams if you hold down with it. That'd be nice. The firepower of the SeaTech Leopard 2A4 would remain the exact same as the BTEC variant at 10.3. Remember, that includes the M33, the shell from 1987 with 530mm flat penetration. It's a familiar tank and will likely not play very differently, but it would be balanced, fun, and extremely capable in the right hands. The next nation over is the USSR, and there are two MBTs for me to talk about here, which in my opinion is one of the factors that would make the Soviets so competitive. Most tiers are going to see two highly capable main battle tanks, and this one is another T-72B. This time, it's the variant from 1989, which was exactly the same as the 85 variant I put at 10.3 earlier, but for the use of Contact 5 explosive reactive armor over Contact 1. Contact 5 is a form of so-called heavy ERA, which not only affects shape charges like heat affair shells, but also breaks apart incoming kinetic munitions, snapping the rods of APFSD shells like pencils. It's very difficult to give accurate values of Contact 5, as it affects different shells differently and doesn't really add armor effectiveness so much as it does reduce the effectiveness of the rounds being fired at it. The stated values are around 800mm kinetic energy effectiveness on the turret, and slightly less than that on the hull, but at this tier, I'm just going to keep it simple and say that any round that hits the Contact 5 will not have a chance of penetrating the tank. We've also got zero chance of penetrating this thing with heat rounds first try, as the Contact 5 gives the frontal arc well over 1000mm chemical effective armor. This basically means automatic survivability of the first incoming round so long as it does not find its way through the gaps between the Contact 5 plates. Higher tier tank shells may be able to penetrate this armor such as the American M829A2 which could penetrate through the Contact 5 and the T-72B's armor from close range but not at far range and the M829A3 and German DM-53 which could pretty much make mincemeat out of this tank from half a continent away. Contact 5 is still ERA however and once it's hit it's gone, leaving that part of the tank exposed. The armor of the tank itself has not changed, so once again, it's equal to the T-80BV, slightly superior to the B currently seen in-game, but mainly it does not feature the massive frontal plate weak spot around the driver port, so think of the armor as being no better, but more reliable. The shells of the T-72B Mod 1989 will be improved over the previous variant, featuring the multi-core 3BM42 Mango as its top shell, likely seeing Vant as the stock shell. Mango, a tungsten long rod with twin cores, is another difficult shell to give accurate numbers on because, like its predecessor, it has much lower penetration in RHAE than it does against composite targets. The twin tungsten cores give it a fantastic penetration against composite armor, but in RHAE it's almost identical to Vant, and all I can say is expect it to penetrate the SeaTech Leopard 2A4 at pretty much any range up to a kilometer, maybe a kilometer and a half. It's likely capable of penetrating in the neighborhood of 600 millimeters of composite armor, and so 
Tinsel might be able to penetrate even the depleted uranium armor equipped M1A1, but funnily enough, despite 3BM42 Mangle being the most heavily exported tank ammunition to date, there really is very little information on its true performance limits. It would have different levels of penetration against the Leopard 2A4 as it would the Abrams, and then different numbers again against the M1A1 heavy variant with DU inserts. Basically, it's complicated, but consider 590 to 600 millimeters a solid estimate for it. This variant of the T-72B would also gain a new ATGM, the 9M119 Sphere, with an estimated 700 millimeters penetration. In all other regards, it's identical to the 10.3 iteration of the T-72B, a slow and steady tank with great protection and good firepower, almost continuing a trend we established with the T-64B back in update 1.77, although this tank would be placed in the line after the other T-72s. The second Russian main battle tank at BR 10.7 is my personal favourite looking MBT of all time, the T-80U. If the T-72B Mod 1989 was simple and easy to explain, then the T-80U is even more so. Basically a T-80BV, but rather than Contact 1, Contact 5. The exact same armament as the T-72B 1989, with Mango as the upgraded APFSD shell and Sphere as the new ATGM. Perhaps this tank and the T-72B 1989 could be given the Cobra stock actually. I think that'd be quite good. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments. So once again, this is a much faster tank than the T-72B 1989. God, we need a shorter name for that. It has the same effectiveness out of its armor, but has bigger weak spots. I'm almost mad that I discussed the Contact 5 and all the weird shell issues when talking about the T-72B, because now we're talking about one of my favorite tanks and I've barely anything to say about it. Having both the 1989 T-72B and the T-80U at 10 10.7 gives the Soviets a front runner and a back burner at the same tier, which offers great strategic opportunities, and the survivability given to the tanks by the Contact 5 will offer up a unique new gameplay experience we've not seen the likes of since the T-90A in 2017's April Fools event. The vehicles would have very good firepower, the best frontal armour for their tier, but on the other hand that ammunition carousel which is prone to throwing the turret into the air as soon as the shell lands anywhere near its side armour. Time for an interesting one. This is the Japanese Type 10 Hitomaru main battle tank, adopted into service in, wait for it, 2012. This tank is a feat of computer engineering with reportedly the most advanced fire control system of any fighting vehicle out there. It features a domestic 120mm gun and super classified composite armor, although what may surprise you is that the tank most probably does not exceed the Type 90 in protection. See, Japan does not have a formal military, they have a self-defense force. As such, they only need to think about deploying tanks within Japan if they were to come under a land-based attack. Not exactly the most likely of circumstances, but developing one of the most advanced main battle tanks out there was probably just a solid bragging initiative for the Japanese government. And it does provide a just-in-case, if Japan ever were called to deploy somewhere else in the world. The Type 90, however, cannot be deployed anywhere but Hokkaido, due to its size and weight, and this restriction called for the Japanese ground self-defense force to also implement alongside it a lighter, more transportable main battle tank that would be more practical for the needs of the armed force it was to serve. The Type 10 is not designed to replace the Type 90, but to supplement it, replacing the last of Japan's Type 74s. The tank was designed primarily to be capable of railway transport and to be able to traverse the majority of Japan's bridges, both of which were criteria that the Type 90 did not adequately fill, barely capable of crossing two-thirds of the many bridges throughout the island nation. The armor, therefore, was designed designed to offer the same protection for less weight, not to offer greater protection. The tank is substantially lighter than the Type 90 and should achieve roughly the same protection, although given War Thunder's penchant for APFSD shells bouncing off of angled plates, something they do not do in real life, the Type 10 may improve upon the effective protection of the Type 90 in practice, while the design of the hull offers a larger weak spot to shoot at. The firepower of the Hitomaru is exceptional, as can be expected for such a modern machine. Most commonly firing the JM-33 shell, which we already know in-game, a likely candidate for this tank's stock shell, the tank also fires a highly secret secreted APFSD shell which you may have heard of before. It's called the Type 10. That's right, the Type 10 tank fires the Type 10 shell. Congratulations to Japan for potentially coming up with a more monotonous naming scheme than Germany. What's surprising though is that for all the secrecy surrounding this shell, some documents have been released showing it its dimensions 
And it's actually a shell we already know, the German-built DM-43 from the mid-1990s. This shell is produced under license by the JSDF, it's a tungsten core monoblock long rod APFSDS and has a penetration of 615mm flat and 360mm at 60 degrees. The tank also undoubtedly would fire the JM-12A1 heat affair shell seen on the Type 90 in-game. One factor that would carry over from the Type 90 is the Type 10's fantastic mobility, with a good power to weight ratio, 27 horsepower per ton, and a top speed of 70 kph in both forward and reverse. Another promising factor is its extremely efficient autoloader, which some sources document can achieve a sustained reload rate of 3 seconds, although only for a limited time. The lack of armour isn't going to help this tank out much, and the autoloader means a 3 man crew, giving the tank quite more survivability, but even that, I did almost put the thing at 11.0, and if you wish to argue that it should be there, then feel free to do so in the comments. Please keep in mind, however, that time frame does not equate to balance, so don't go saying that because of how modern it is, it should come higher, because the combat effectiveness of the tank is the most important factor in finding a balanced spot for it, not the year of its introduction. Next up at 10.7, we're moving to Italy with the C1 Ariete. This is an interesting tank, with fantastic firepower, but armour that makes the challenge of one look well protected. This tank looks outwardly very similar to the Vickers MBT Mark VII, although it doesn't really share anything in common with the British prototype. It was put into active service in 1995, same year as the Leopard 2A5, and uses the same L44 120mm smoothbore gun. It has a 4-man crew and a 1270 horsepower engine, giving it a very nice power to weight ratio of 29 horsepower per tonne. This comes at a cost, however. The tank has next to no effective armour, at 450mm kinetic armour on the turret, 700mm versus chemical, and a ridiculously poor 300mm kinetic armour on the hull, while having 600mm chemical. This is due to the tank having, get this, spaced armour in the hull. No composite. What on earth were the Italians thinking? Probably thinking about the next slice of pizza, actually. The tank at least has some pretty amazing firepower, with the M322 APFSDS shell, which is the Italian designation for the German DM43 shell we just mentioned with the Type 10. High firepower and low armour on a relatively speedy vehicle with a nice low silhouette, Sounds like a worthy play to me. Now, this finishes us off for 10.7, and these are the tanks that I believe will come this patch, update 1.87. This gives almost every nation a competitive machine, except Port France. You may notice I haven't mentioned the Leclerc yet, but we'll get to it. I haven't forgotten about it, hold on. Just as 10.0 has been a balanced plateau for us up until this point, 10.7 would create another even step, waiting for future updates before introducing our subsequent machines. Battle rating 11.0 is where we start to see more heavily armoured main battle tanks that still retain highly respectable armour protection even to this day. We're also starting to escape from the realms where each nation will have a tank to put forth, which is something we'll have to deal with later, but first let's do this in order. The first 11.0 tank I want to talk about is the M1A1 HA, or heavy armour variant, used extensively in the Gulf Wars and featuring depleted uranium armour. This is where you can start arguing that the Abrams will be slower, as the turret features depleted uranium inserts that increase the tank's combat weight by several tons. In every other regard, guess what, this is exactly the same as the M1A1 at BR 10.7, at least in War Thunder terms. Slightly slower, but same dimensions, same power pack, same gun, same shells even, at least according to my proposition. The hull is also the exact same, and get used to this because America has never upgraded the armour of the Abrams hull, not since 1979. So what's the big difference here? Well, obviously the DU inserts, but what exactly does that look like for us from a War Thunder perspective. Well, depleted uranium is a highly dense and brittle material, making it great for defence from kinetic energy munitions, but actually worse than the base M1A1's armour for protection from chemical threats. The depleted uranium plates are inserted directly into the turret, which calls for the removal of a layer of the existing Chobham armour, meaning that the M1A1 HA actually achieves only around 900 to 1000 millimetres effective protection on the turret against shaped charges. I say only, but that's still pretty fantastic. The protection of the hull is a familiar 350mm kinetic and 750mm chemical, but it's the turret's kinetic energy effective armour which is important to us. 600mm on this sucker. This is a huge amount of armour protection, impenetrable by just about everything I've mentioned so far from any sort of range beyond point blank. It's a good job we still have that mantlet and turret ring to fire at. 
The Abrams here, however, will function in the same way that the Abrams in-game currently does, in that it currently only has M774, by far the least penetration of its tier. In fact, well over 100mm lower than the highest penetration of the tier. The M1A1HA will also start to be left behind in penetration, but considering that this tank will get such effective turret armour, I feel like that's okay. Once again, the weakness of the mantlet and the relative strength of the shells at this tier means that a successful penetration of the mantlet is likely to one-shot the tank by penetrating into the ammunition storage at the back of the turret and causing a cook-off that the broken blowout panels will not be able to save you from. This variant of the Abrams is hugely significant from a historical perspective, an iconic variant introducing the famed DU armour, and it'll be a nice change of pace from anything so far. This next tank... Mm -mm, this one excites me. The T-90A, first main battle tank produced by the Russian Federation after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Remember 2017's April Fools? Well, we're back, baby. The original T-90 Vladimir was literally just a rebranded T-72B model with the new APS, but this one, the T-90A, offers up some noticeable improvements. The armour of this tank is practically identical to the T-72B Mod 1989, so extremely good thanks to the Contact 5 explosive reactive armour, not so hot once it's destroyed at this tier. This variant of the T-90 entered service in the early 2000s and features those signature evil red eyes, which are IR Dazzlers, part of the Stora or Curtain active protection system. This is designed to jam Sacklos guided missiles and detect laser designators such as those used to range find or guide Hellfire missiles for example. Once detected, this system can automatically fire a smoke screen using the T-90A smoke grenades, thus being lost to the laser guidance systems of hostile forces, although I suspect that a fully automatic system would not be implemented in War Thunder. What will likely happen is that similar to the incoming missile warning for aircraft, the T-90A will receive a warning when an anti-tank missile is launched at it or a laser from a range find or Hellfire missile is pointed at it. While the player would manually launch the smoke grenades to cover from this, or hit a specific keybind to jam incoming ATGMs. I would think that this system would be implemented, at least in some form, as it gives the T-90A something really unique that could be a significant help to it, and its main improvement over the T-72B. Perhaps the Stora system itself would be a Tier 1 or 2 upgrade module, while the ATGM jammer would be an additional feature as a Tier 4 upgrade, or this part may not come at all. The T-90A houses a 950 horsepower power diesel engine giving it a power to weight ratio of just over 20 horsepower per tonne, slightly higher than the T-72B. However, it retains the same 60 kph top speed, still somewhat slower than the T-80 series and other top tier MPTs currently. The firepower of the T-90A would be improved in all aspects, with a new ATGM and HERA face shell alongside the new APFSDS being fired out of its improved 2A46M2 125mm smoothbore. This new sable shell will be the 3BM46 Sphinx depleted uranium shell which replaced the earlier 3BM42. This is another shell with a relatively low penetration against rolled homogeneous armour, but significantly higher against composite armour, at least over 600mm, meaning that it could easily punch through the M1A1HA at up to around 500 meters range. This would be the upgraded shell, while the 3BM42 Mango would be the T90A stock shell. The T90A would also fire the improved 3BK29M HERA FS shell with 700mm penetration at any range, and the ATGM would now be improved with the 9M119 M Reflex, a tandem warhead with 750mm penetration in RHAE, but the capability of easily punching through NATO ERA. Once again, remember that like the T-72s, the ammunition carousel of the T-90A is significantly less vulnerable than those of the T-64 and T-80 series, and although the tank lacks speed and maneuverability, it should prove significantly powerful at 11.0. A funny thing though is that in the April Fools event of 2017, this tank was matched up against the Leopard 2A5. However, in the current game, I really don't see this being the case. The Leopard 2A5 will have to come at a higher battle rating. Number one reason for this is that in the April Fools event, armour was heavily approximated and the algorithm wasn't properly equipped to handle the extremely complex modelling of the penetration of advanced composite armour with these types of shells. So these tanks could be artificially balanced up against each other by raising some values or lowering others. Number two reason is that players are much more equated with how to easily destroy particularly Russian tanks these days, with even the slightest angle providing an easy side shot into the ammunition rack and one-shotting the tank. At the time of this event, the most advanced tank we'd played in the game was the Leopard A1A1, and it didn't even have APFSDS at the time. Players weren't familiar with just how easily you could overmatch the side armour of the T-90A, which meant that angling was actually a legitimate strategy, whereas nowadays, the second you angle a Russian top-tier tank at anything but full frontal, you're dead. 
One shot, straight through the side, into the car sale. You cannot angle a Russian tank to increase its armor. We were used to a slow tank meta back then as well, with the IS-4M and T-10M being some of the top tanks in the game. Remember, there was no MBT-70 or T-64A. We weren't familiar with the maps we were fighting on during that event, and there really was no meta being an April Fool's joke. Everyone was just running around, having fun, rather than focusing on squeezing every bit of potential out of these tanks. The way that the game has changed in the last two years has directly benefited the playstyle of tanks like the Leopard 2 and destroyed that of the Russian counterparts. Therefore, lining up the T-90A at 11.0 while the Leopard 2A5 sits a bit higher is far more balanced, at least in my opinion. Time for all the French viewers to get real happy with the AMX-56... <coughs> Please never call it AMX-56. The tank was never called that. That name is completely made up. It makes me so mad. <clears throat> anyway, the Char Leclerc. Now, I don't pretend to know much about the prototype, pre-series, or early series Leclerc MBTs, but I'm almost certain that one of them could fit at 10.3 or 10.7. I've no idea of the armor statistics, although I do know that early variants would fire the same shells as the AMX-40 in-game currently, but I would hope that one, if not two of these, are added in earlier than 11.0 in the battle ratings. Since I don't know their capabilities, I decided to leave them out of this video, but the variant that we're talking about for 11.0 is the more modern Series 3. Produced in the early 2000s, by Giat before they became Nexter, now merged with the German company Kraus Maffei, the Leclerc is a highly advanced main battle tank featuring a 1500 horsepower engine which gives it a power to weight ratio of over 27.5 horsepower per tonne and a top speed of over 70 kph, 55 in reverse. The Leclerc uses an auto loader with a reload rate of 5 seconds which reduces the crew count down to 3, never a good thing in War Thunder. What is good, however, is that the gunner specifically has a massive amount of armor protection. The Leclerc's armor is modular, and as such can be outfitted to fulfill a predetermined role, sacrificing power to weight ratio in order to equip more armor should the need to engage hostile main battle tanks ever arise for it. We'll be focusing on a standard outfit for the Leclerc's armor, however, which puts the turret at around 600mm KE effectiveness average, but rising up to nearly 700mm effectiveness directly in front of the gunner. That's enough armor protection that the only tanks in-game capable of penetrating that would be the Leopard 2A5 and T90M. The hull of the Leclerc achieves an effectiveness of 500mm, matching the Challenger 2 as one of the best hulls in the game. While the chemical protection of the Leclerc is quite lacking comparatively, at 800mm on the turret and 570mm on the hull. The weak point of the Leclerc's armour protection, however, is the gun mantlet. This thing is ridiculously poor, paper thin, to the point where even some 20mm auto cannons have been reported to penetrate right through the gun mantlet. This means that all the IFVs in game could still penetrate the Leclerc frontally if they can get close enough to accurately fire at the gun mantlet, which admittedly is not very big. The firepower of the Leclerc is impressive, down to the CN120 by 26 L52 caliber smoothbore gun, which fires the OFL120 F1 APFSD shell. French designation for the familiar German DM43 round. The gun being longer, however, means that the shell achieves a higher muzzle velocity and therefore a higher penetration, at around 625mm flat and 380mm at 60 degrees. This is seriously powerful, rivaling the T90A's shell against flat armour, but noticeably superior in the 60 degree. All this coming from a tank that has never seen combat, and for that gets called mediocre. I hope all my French viewers will appreciate my defence of this thing, because it's a really capable tank. The Leclerc's high mobility, quick reload, fantastic armor protection, and incredible firepower will make it certainly one of the most noteworthy tier 7 tanks, which is great for France to have, because they really don't have many tanks. It should make for a highly capable 11.0 and will no doubt remain seriously competitive even in a future up tier. Well, that's it for 11.0, and this is another nice plateau for us to finish at in a single update. The problem would be Germany, as once again the Leopard 2A5 is going to have to go higher in the battle ratings than this. We'll get to it though, don't worry, although there is the Leopard 2A4 improved. Basically, a Leopard 2A5 prototype, which fired only DM33 and had a less effective arrowhead turret piece in the current production series Leopard 2A5. This means that the tank would have superior armor protection to the SeaTech Leopard 2A4 at 10.7, but noticeably inferior to the Leopard 2A5, and would not fire nearly as capable shells as even the DM43 seen on the C1 Ariete at 10.7. So I do think it could make for a great 11.0. Thing is, I don't have any information on actual numbers for the effectiveness of the turret armor, nor could I find footage of this tank, so I decided to leave it out of the main discussion for 11.0 and save it to mention here instead. I do once again think it could make a good 11.0 
1.0, which is good for Germany, as otherwise the jump between the 10.7 Leopard 2A4 and the Leopard 2A5 would be massive. And for one of the most major nations of War Thunder and most noteworthy military nations in the Western world, this really is not a good thing. I hope the Leopard 2A4 Improved does get added at 11.0, and I wish I had more information on it to talk about it properly, just the same as with the early series Leclerc's, which would help France bridge the gap between the AMX 40 and this tank, and likely give them a 10.3 or 10.7 MBT, which would have them included in the little plateau we established at 10.7. There's also the C2 Ariete, or Ariete Mark II, which is not in production as far as I know, and it's at least not in service. It's a proposed upgrade which increases the power to weight ratio with a new engine and supposedly has additional armour, although I've no idea how much. This tank could make for a decent 11.0, if not exactly the best, and like with the Leopard 2A5 prototype and early series of the Clerk, please don't think that because I didn't specifically talk about them, that I'm saying they shouldn't have come, because they definitely should. I just don't want to flap my gums about something I don't have enough knowledge to talk about comfortably. Well lads, I hope you have enjoyed this video, I've enjoyed making it. Unfortunately, it's getting really long now, so the part where I talk about truly modern tanks like the Leopard 2A5, T72, B3 and M1A2 has been made a part 2. I highly recommend you go watch that, it's going to be fantastic. There'll be an annotation on screen right now and a link in the description just underneath the timestamps for all the battle ratings. If you did enjoy this part, it would mean a huge amount to me if you could leave a like and comment, share it around. Anyway, I thank you for watching this far guys and I hope to see you in part 2.